Thank you. Now, that was a very interesting uh, talk that we just saw with Milo. I cannot top that. So it's only going downhill from here now. I will be talking about mental resilience. And what I will present you is a research that I've done together with my PhD students on aging and uh, cognitive uh, performance. So I will uh, give a brief overview of successful aging. Uh, yesterday, I was at a, a different meeting in Brighton, also talking about successful aging. And you will see why I focus on the label successful aging instead of what people call uh, the other the flip side of dementia or chronic decline. I will focus on emotions and working memory with several uh, experiments. Um, then in the second part, uh, focus on cognitive reserve. And finally, focusing on physical capability and cognition. You will see that I will be using a lot of different methodology. So uh, longitudinal studies, secondary data analysis, computational modeling, and uh, lab-based experiments. Now, it's not the case that you have to memorize all the stuff that I'm going to show you just to, to demonstrate that you can have an interdisciplinary or even multidisciplinary approach to the science of aging. And at the end, I will talk briefly about how we can move the research into practice. So it's one thing of doing lots of great research, and there will be a lot of great research being presented here, um, but how do we speed up the, the implementation into practice so that we all can age successfully? Now, this is a picture that you might be familiar with. Uh, those of you who are not familiar with, what this shows is, uh, as function of age, various numbers of uh, cognitive functions decline. And you see the speed of processing in green declines with age, working memory, long-term memory, but world knowledge seems to be, at the very least, stable or even increase. So this is information you gather as you grow older. So it makes sense that that, that, that actually in, in, increases or improves with age. Now, this is a very pessimistic view of, of uh, aging, where everything is just declining and over, over a certain uh, age limit, many of our quantum faculties have deteriorated. That's a very pessimistic view. And I do not agree with this pessimistic view, by the way, and we'll show you why. Another famous picture that is talked about when we talk about aging is a very um, uh, negative uh, approach to aging, where everything is declining, where you have at a younger age, you have a certain level, and as you grow old, it only goes down. Yeah. Uh, there's a talk about on reserve, and I will talk about that in the second part of the talk. And there is uh, what is called the minimal cognitive threshold. If you go below that threshold, you will be functionally impaired. There will be deterioration. You might be hospitalized, or you might have all kinds of uh, problems that require support, that require um, additional care. So what you really want to have is to stay above that threshold. Now, in this Typical line. Uh, so you want to stay on the blue line here. And uh, the idea is if you now have during your life um, uh, um, biological or mental problems, such as, for example, receive a stroke, you actually uh, speed up the decline. Yeah? If you're unfortunate enough to have multiple of these life events, you might end up on the red trajectory, meaning that you would uh, reach that minimal kind of threshold earlier than if you would not have had that though, those uh, those events. I'm interested in how we can go from what the yellow or the red line back to the blue line. That's my interest. When we look at this blue line, you could say this kind of aging with with no pathology that would be successful aging. That would be the type of aging that um, you might uh, uh, die before you, your 
your cognitive ability reaches that threshold. That's the ideal situation. So you have a, a long life without um, the cognitive impairments or such that you would be hospitalized or require vision support. When preparing for this talk, I was looking for good diagrams. Like I'm not a cartoonist, so I cannot draw nice figures and all that. So I need to find um, nice uh, figures on the internet. And I found this one from a paper by Reuter Lorenz on the stick. And Reuter Lorenz will come, um, her, her work will, will show up in the reserve section of this talk. What they've done is they said, well, there's a whole bunch of information that we know that relates to aging. And they look at um, uh, genetic factors, uh, cardiovascular, what is good for the heart, is good for the brain. Um, that, uh, Roger Lawrence and others have lots of theories about what the brain is doing, how it compensates for um, a cognitive uh, deterioration, how it improves. Uh, kind of training programs, particularly in psychology and education, that's talked a, a, about a lot. And there's some theories that include emotion in the, the narrative as well. What I like about this picture, uh, you will, uh, I will come back to that several times, is on this side, it's referred to as successful aging, whereas the flip side of it is the kind of decline and dementia. When you are preparing material for the general public, typically say you want to prevent dementia or you want to prevent quantum decline. Well, that's a negative frame. And what happens is if you have a negative uh, uh, frame uh, in which you provide information, people are, are more risk-seeking, meaning they will not uh, address your, your, your recommendations. If, however, you frame it in a positive way, successful aging, then people are more risk averse. This is known from decision-making theory. There's nothing special about this, but it does mean that if you're gonna in, um, try to nudge people to a more successful or healthier lifestyle, frame it in a positive way instead of saying that you're preventing something negative. It's just a way of dealing with, 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 the, with the human cognition. Yeah. So while I'm focusing on successful aging, I'm basically saying, I'm looking at preventing cognitive decline. I'm talking about the same thing. I'm going to start with um, influence of emotion on working memory in aging. And then I'm going to talk about quantum reserve and compensation. And the third part is uh, physical activity and uh, cognitive performance. So emotions, working memory, and aging. You might say, what have these things in common? Turns out, emotions and working memory interact. Working memory and aging interact. And aging and emotions interact as well. So what, what is happening if you have all three of them vary? This is a snapshot of what the literature is, is saying. And this is work done by Natalie Berger, who was a PhD student of mine. And in the literature, it talks about that cognition and emotion are related. The, if you're more anxious, your quantum of control is lowered. Um, and there's many, many, there's an entire literature dedicated to this. So we know quite a lot about this axis. We also know, which I just showed you earlier in the first slide, that as you grow older, there's a decline in quantum functioning. A lot of literature on that as well. Now, as we age, there's preserved emotional functioning. So now we have age having a positive, uh, having negative relation with cognition, having a preserved influence with emotion. So what is happening with the cognition emotion relation as we grow older? Guess what? It's actually very hard to find literature on this because nobody's actually doing these three things at the same time. Each of those edges is a massive literature on its own right. And this is a snapshot of what the literature looks like. So there are theories about executive function and motion. Here, do particular theories here. Um, executive functions of aging, all of them saying that 
working memory declines as we age. Emotion and aging, there's a social emotional selectivity theory, a dynamic integration theory that talks about the relation between emotion and, and aging. But none of these theories are referring to each other, are talking to each other. So this is this obvious gap in the literature. And this is a, a, a slide from uh, Natalie Burke's PhD thesis. And she went through all this, this literature and in order to come up with studies to, to do, you need to make choices, you need to make decisions on what to, to, to focus on. And we decided to focus on working memory. Now, working memory is not one thing. That's the first thing that you need to realize. It's not just one measure and then you have your working memory value. Working memory is a collection of functions, of quantum abilities that together allow you to be adaptive in, in, the, in, in the environment. We chose this particular paper by Miyaki et al. because what they done in that paper was looking at three different functions of working memory. There are more, but they focus on three different functions. And these functions are shifting or switching, updating and inhibition. And each of these functions is related or is required for certain tests. So for shifting, uh, Miyaki al. used three different tests. I'll not go into detail on these tests, but just each of these squares is a test. Updating, that there's three different tests. Inhibition, another three different tests. And what they've done in that study is test a lot of participants, gave them nine tests to complete, and with statistics show that these three blocks of tasks do separate into the three different functions. And that's your latent factors here, shifting, updating, and inhibition. What you also see is that they're not fully independent. There are overlaps. So a person who's good at updating might also be good at the inhibition function. Yeah, It's not perfect. So they're sufficiently uh, different from each other and there's some overlap. And what Miyake all did was they look at what happens with other measures. Now, what I'm going to look at is what happens with age. That's, that's the focus here. So is it the case that some of these functions differ or change with age and others do not? Do they improve with age? Do they decline with age? That information hasn't been done in the literature and hasn't even been done with emotion included in the test. So that's our, our focus. Now, we're not going to give people nine different tests. That would be too much. So what we did was take for every single one of these three uh, latent factors, one test. And we added an emotional component within that test to address our question. So the first test that we did was an NBAC test. And uh, that test measures updating. Now, let me go through what a person would do. For all of the, the, the studies in this uh, block, we used faces of young people and faces of older people. And these faces either had an emotional expression or a neutral expression. So these were our materials and which we based our test on. So in the NBAC test, we had two versions, an expression test and an age test. In expression test, you have to focus on the expression of the face. In age test, you have to focus on the, the age of the, of the person in a photo. Um, the NBAC test is a test where you have to say whether the current face is having something similar or different than a face and trials back. So in a, in a one back, which is an easy one, you have to say whether this person's expression is the same as expression of the face you saw just before. So you first see this one, you can say, okay, this one's smiling. Now you see this one is smiling. So yes, that's the same expression. And then you see the next uh, face and this one is angry. So that's a different one than you saw before. So every time you respond and you see a new face, you need to update your information in working memory, right? That's why it's an updating test. 
Now, that's an easy one. You just have to say what happened, if it's similar or different than the one before. A two-back test is where you have to say whether this person's face is same or different than two faces back. So that's much more difficult. So now you have to maintain this one. Then also put this in your working memory. But when you see this, respond to two back and then switch your system into maintaining that one for the next trial. So that's much more involved. So we have two levels of difficulty, a one back and a two back. So this is for the expression test. And the same thing for the age test where the question is, is this person's face uh, of the same kind of uh, age bracket as the, the one, one back or two back, right? Now, why we did that? We did that because we wanted to know whether the benefit of positive emotions we see in the literature with aging requires uh, processing the emotion or not. Here, there's always an emotional expression present but they don't have to process it. They don't have to make a, a judgment on this. Whereas here, you do have to make a, a judgment on that. The literature didn't say it, didn't, didn't provide us that needed information. So, done the study, lots of data here. You just have to eyeball it because here, the age test. So first of all, you will see that all the blue, uh, all the yellow bars are larger than the than the gray bars. The yellow bars are the older individuals and the gray bars are the young individuals. And these are all reaction times. So you can see that across all of this, the older adults are slower. Nothing special. This is, this is what, what, uh, what will happen in all the, the studies. But what you see in the, on the right-hand side, the age test, it's no difference uh, in relation to the, the emotion that is presented in the face. Whereas in expression tasks, you do find differences. So first thing we know is people have to process the emotion in order to get in the effect of emotion. So just having the emotion in the background is not enough to get the emotion effect. So it needs to be processed. That's number one um, uh, uh, take-home measures from a scrap. The other one is it's about the matches and not the mismatches that will show the effect. So remember, the mismatches is saying whether or not it's uh, different, whereas the matches is saying it is different, so it has to be a match in order to have the emotion effect appearing. And it interacts with uh, the, the age of the participant. If you're older, you have a bigger effect than if you're younger. So what we found with this particular study is that, yes, with the working memory function called updating, we do find an age effect. And this age effect is uh, affected by the emotion of the stimuli when the emotion is processed. Okay, so that's we know at least one thing. We know about the updating function of uh, working memory um, as this pattern. Okay, now let's have a look at... Uh, oh, yeah, and then we, we've noticed this uh, pattern specifically for the angry faces. So we want to zoom in on the angry faces. So what we've done is a study where, again, uh, a two-back version, right? this is the probe, this is the target. Right? So in this case, you have to say it's different because this person is angry and this person is happy. So you say here, oh, it's different than two faces back. But you have this one back lure, which is neutral, and you have this three back lure, which is a happy face. So we're going to all the combinations. And what you found was that in the younger adults, this test didn't show much effect of whether the previous trial or the lure trials are angry or neutral. All of these are, are quite similar. For all the adults, there was an effect, but only for those when the, the participant had to see an angry probe, like here, and there was a neutral lure. Whether that neutral lure was here, one back, or three back, they were faster. So again, there's something special with angry faces in all the adults in an updating test. And that... We'll come back later when I talk about what how information should be presented.
Okay, so updating functional working memory has an effect, shows an effect of emotion in an elderly. What about inhibition function? Here, what we did was stimuli like these. So here's a person with an angry expression, and the word angry is written on top of that. Now, what you have to do is indicate what the, what the expression emotion <laughs> is. So here you say angry, which is the same as what's written. Here, you have to say neutral, but happy is written on top of the, the stimulus. So that, that confuses you. So you're a bit slower to say, oh, this is a neutral face because you have a tendency to say happy. And here's a, a person who's happy and it's just some access, which is like a neutral condition. This is a, this is a reference condition. So we call this a congruent con a trial. We call this an incongruent trial and we call this a neutral trial. So same thing. We have younger adults doing this test. We have older adults doing tests. And we want to know if there's a difference uh, between the two groups that interacts, we also look for interaction, that interacts with the emotion in the stimuli. Short answer, no. No interaction. Of course, there is the overall slowdown in older adults compared to younger adults, but there is no difference uh, in the performance profile of older adults and younger adults. So here we have a working memory function that is not different between the two, being young and old. Okay. So already you can see that the story of saying that working memory is going down with age, that is not, not the right level. There, there's some, some of them that remains the same. The third uh, working memory function, switching, is where a person has to switch between tasks. So we have an uh, emotion task and an age task. In the emotion task, people have to indicate what the expression, emotion expression is of the face. In the age task, they just have to say the person's young or old. And what, how we do that is we have this horizontal line. If a face appears uh, at the bottom of that line, you have to uh, do the emotion version of the test. If it's above the line, you have to do the age version of the test. And it and the, and the faces appear in four locations, right? So it just uh, keeps cycling. So you know exactly what test will be uh, required from you. And we're only going to look at a switching one because that that is the the, the working memory function we want to know about. Long story short, again, no interaction. Of course, we see that older adults are slower than younger adults. We also see that the emotion tests in both groups are slower than the age test, but there are no interactions that are significant where it shows that older adults in the emotion tests are any different than, than the younger adults. So, which is a not, uh, quite a large number of experiments we have done. But the take home message from this is that in uh, working memory, the updating show age effects that interact with emotion, whereas inhibition and switching do not show that. They just show general, uh, general slow responses. So how does that tally up with the first picture that I showed that everything is going down? There was this working memory component here as well that's going down. So what is missing? Or did we misinterpret this figure? And if you, if you look at these uh, tests that they use, these are tests for measuring capacity of working memory. They do not address processing of working memory. What I would like to say here is that some working memory processes are affected by emotion as, as people grow older, and some are no different from younger adults. So there would be some working memory processing that will basically be a flat line, doesn't change with age. Now, this is, a, this is a different story than always presenting these figures saying everything's going downhill. That's not the case. I and mean, we should move away from that. We need to be more specific about what does and does not go down. Okay. So this is about emotion. Now, the figure that I showed you before started with a, a, a point of capacity that, that decreases. And there's a, Many theories that's referred to as quantum reserve. Uh, 
which is the, the mental resilience in the face of, of, of uh, biological deterioration. There are many different uh, versions of this, as uh, talked about in literature. Uh, there's individual differences, and that's why people are interested in this. Uh, so you have people with high cognitive reserve and uh, people with low cognitive reserve. And as pathology increases, those people with high cognitive reserve will reach a, a, a critical threshold later than a person who has low as a cognitive reserve. So a person with high cognitive reserve can take on more of the biological hits without getting into functional impairment. Right? So we want to know, can we improve our cognitive reserve? Are there determinants of cognitive reserve? Um, a famous suggestion is that quantum reverse breaks down into lifestyle factors and educational uh, levels. So as you can already see, you cannot measure quantum reserve directly. So there is a, a big research question of what are the best proxies? And that's where people disagree on. But overall, people do agree on that education and operational attainment is relevant and what you do in uh, your uh, as leisure activities might be relevant. This brain data, and a lot of that, that relates to quantum reserve. So one example that I will, I will flesh out a bit more in a second is that younger adults show under activation uh, for a particular test compared to older adults. So what you see here is an, uh, what you see here at the bottom is actually the best example. When a test is difficult, an older person tends to recruit more brain uh, matter than a younger adult for the same level of accuracy. So it might be that older adults are a kind of tapping into untapped resources uh, to still perform the task well. And we know from brain data that the, when all the adults are recruiting the other uh, hemisphere, uh, brain hemisphere, they are functionally connected. So they actually are doing something in tandem in their data. And that functional connectivity uh, does relate to accuracy in in the in the in the trials. So that gives us one of several theories out there where um, input is provided to both brain hemispheres. And in younger adults, only one hemisphere dominates the response and gives the response. Whereas in older adults who have a high quantum reserve, the hemispheres are talking to each other to then perform and, and give the, uh, uh, the output. Okay. So this is one theory in the literature, and we've used that in, in, a, in a computational method to see, is this actually possible? Does it really work uh, theoretically? First of all, we need to find a test that show the effect, and then see if we can do a computer simulation of that test. So the test here is by Roger Lawrence. And what people have to do is they see uh, uh, on the screen uh, a stimulus like this. So here there's letter A and S at the same time. And uh, on either the same side of the, the target letter, uh, a probe is presented. So here in this case, A. So this will be in the same hemifield or an opposite hemifield. <coughs> now what happens, things that are presented on the left-hand side of the screen, will first go to the right hemisphere before it transfers to the left hemisphere. And opposite is the case if you present it uh, to the right hemisphere. So if you present the stimulus uh, very quickly, you can influence which hemisphere receives the information first, and hopefully which one is actually doing the actual quantum work. In this data, and what people have to do is uh, say whether this um, stimulus, the letter A, is presented anywhere um, on the top. So in both cases, the person would have to say yes, right? And you measure the, the button press. So what you see here is 
uh, the task difficulty as uh, with the um, the different conditions. The task difficulty here is the easy one would be a scenario with only two letters. A, a hard uh, task difficulty would be if there's four letters or above. So if it's easy, you see that the within um, hemisphere reaction time or response time um, is smaller than the between one, meaning that if you are in the easy condition, you have a certain reaction time, and it takes you longer if you're in a harder condition, or sorry, if you're in the between uh, condition. This is stronger for old adults than for young adults, and it flips if you make the test harder. If you make the test harder, so we have now four letters, it is the old adults that show benefit here. And the theory that Reuter Lorenz suggested is that the, the other hemisphere is helping out. Okay. You saw this earlier model of the, of the, of the relay model. So we, we made a version of this as well. The details of that is in the paper, but what it comes down to is we made a in the in the computer simulation a left hemisphere version and a right hemisphere version, and all of these feed into your working memory to make a judgment of what if if that particular letter is presented up there, yes or not. So that's all of this part here. Now. We need to have a system that measures if it's difficult or not. And uh, there's, there's some literature on conflict monitoring. If a test is hard, if it's conflicting information, there are some brain regions called anterior cingulates that monitors, that detects, ah, oh, this is a difficult test. So the brain has a signal for this. What if that signal is used to then trigger the other hemisphere to participate in the processing? Because effectively, that is what the theory is suggesting. So we connected this up in an actual computer simulation to see if that actually does work. And it's not perfect, the, the, the full interaction, but the qualitative pattern is there. So it is the case that if you have uh, your brain system where one part is monitoring how difficult the test is and use that to open the gate between the hemispheres, then you do get that, that profile. The only thing you have to do is um, say what the threshold is when that gate opens. And that threshold might be varied with age. Yeah. So it's a very, in this case, a parsimonious account of how you could recruit the other hemisphere at the benefit of the task and how that relates to aging. Yeah. There, there are many more differences you could explore in computer simulations, such as dopamine hypothesis, which is there uh, as well, and other brain regions. But this is a um, very simple, short uh, demonstration that these theories do, do uh, provide a, good, a reasonable account. Now, there are many other theories out there. So what I just showed you was uh, an instantiation of a hemispheric model, but there's also another model called a PASA, which is a posterior anterior shift with aging, where uh, older adults have more frontal brain regions being activated in a test compared to younger adults. There's one from Crunch. There's also uh, theories that says, well, actually, um, all these neuroimaging theories are all part of a larger scaffolding theory. So here's a, a theory that accounts for more variance in the literature. And then very recently, they decided to um, um, really expand that, that uh, theoretical framework in the stack R. Now, this is how stack, the scaffolding theory, looks like. So early on, I showed you uh, a theory that was very small, very simple, straightforward. What has happened over the years is the theories became more and more complex. You see here that you have the aging is affecting the neural cha challenges and the functional deterioration. And both of these have different in, uh, influence on cognitive function. 
Okay. Exercise and bilateral. So bilaterality, I just showed you an example of that. Exercise is what we come down to next. See, kind of training, new learning, engagement, all the other factors were talked about in that scaffold theory. So this was Stack in 2009. Stack R in 2014, five years later, is even more complex. Right? And this is a life course model of the scaffolding theory, where again, you have your experiences. You have your brain structure and brain function with various things that influences it. So these are all massive amount of literatures that feed into this particular theory. Intervention, which is what we want to uh, go towards, um, is part of this, this theory as well. We have here, again, our bilateral recruitment. So you can see that the, the theory just gets bigger and bigger. So the earlier picture of everything is going down, that is too simple. That's a very simple, uh, too simplistic uh, view of uh, quantitative aging. And uh, we're looking at the level of uh, quantitative function and the rate of quantitative change. They can be dissociated from each other. It's not the case that a person who has high quantitative uh, uh, function will also have a higher rate. No, these are distinguishable in, in many epidemiological studies. So that is where we are now. Very complex theory, and everybody, as we sit here, is probably doing work somewhere along that that uh, the diagram. If you have this these large data sets, like I said, in epidemiological studies, you can do something else as well. Because the the key thing is, how do you measure this quantum reserve? Right? We talk about quantum reserve, but you need to measure it. It cannot be, be a latent factor in all your studies. So here's one where uh, these people use a, a, a cohort uh, a study, the ELSA study, where every two years participants are being tested on a various range of, of, of uh, uh, tests. And also what the educational level is, what the leisure activities is. And they formed a measure uh, of quantum reserve and they demonstrated that people with uh, low, medium, or high quantum reserve, that that predicts the risk of dementia. So measuring quantum reserve in some way is actually very beneficial from, uh, from a predictive uh, risk factor point of view. Yeah. So what is this measure? This measure that they use is formed from the CRIC, the quantum reserve index. It has been used uh, in many different studies it is also translated in different languages. What the CRIC is doing is it measures uh, education, which is simply what's your education level, and there's a score attached to that. What's your working activity? They have a score for different types of working activities. If it's manual work, if it's uh, managerial work, etc., they have a, a score attached to that, and leisure time. Now, and there's like 14 different uh, ledger activities that they have in their in their um, questionnaire. Now, this maps up quite nicely with the diagram I showed you earlier. Right, it's called a reserve and educational level. So that's the years of education. That is the occupational attainment, reading habits, and social activities and cultural activities would relate to leisure time. And this is where I get really interested and say, okay, so now you have lifestyle factors that relates to quantum reserve. Now, depending on what you what you do for your education, depending on what you end up doing uh, as a job, they're kind of fixed, but you can always change your leisure activities, right? So now we, we're talking about modifiable risk factors here. And those of you who know the Lancet paper, I decided not to put this because... Every, every talk will have this, this snake pattern of the Lancet paper where it shows the risk factors of dementia. I haven't spoken about dementia the whole time, but I'm talking about it implicitly because I'm talking about successful aging. Yeah. So I want to now know about leisure activities. The leisure activities that I chose, oops, is physical fitness. I could have chosen the other ones, diet and all that. I have some nice data on diet. But uh, I want to look at physical fitness. Okay, 
Another PhD student of mine, oh, I have to mention the computational modeling was done with a PhD student, Nick Randall, uh, who, who's done a work on all kinds of modeling of Scotland Reserve. This is done with um, Isabel Rizzo, who um, did a uh, two systematic reviews of the literature on longitudinal studies of um, physical fitness and aging and physical fitness and dementia. That's what she did there. Now, you might say, oh, there's lots of studies out there. Yes, there's a lot of studies, a lot of longitudinal studies uh, internationally, nationally, where they have all these measures. The thing is, they're all over the place. They use different metrics for measuring physical fitness. It was very hard to combine things that end up having the same met measures. But we managed. We, we have some, some results here. I'm only going to show you two of them. There's much more. Um, the sit to stand test and the grip strength. Sit to stand test is a test where a person sits down, put a hand on the uh, on the chest, and then stands up. And sits down again, stands up, and do that for thirty seconds um, as quickly as possible, and you count how many. Or you have the person um, doing this um, and measure how long it takes to do, let's say, thirty of those. Okay, yeah. that is a very easy test to do. And you can see in this uh, forest plot that that shows a significant effect with uh, the mini mental state examination several years later. Yeah, so it's a predictor. Same thing with the grip strength. The grip strength is you will have a dynamometer, like a, a squeezer, so to speak, and it measures your strength in, in your arms. And you do on the left hand side, the right hand side, and you take the strongest you can get uh, as your measure. That um the better that uh, the stronger your, your grip strength the the better your quantum performance several years later so we have we've done gone through all the literature on this and this is what's out there okay now i want to go back to physical fitness because you cannot have meter uh you cannot have a dynamic meter and um um, the sit to stand test every single time is cumbersome. So you, ideally, you want to have a proxy. A proxy would be a self-reported questionnaire. So we found one, and uh, this particular fit fitness questionnaire has 15 questions that taps into three different um, domains. Now, what we wanted to do was um, look at whether this physical fitness matters or if it has a utility. First of all, we validated the test. It's not perfect validation. We still try to uh, update it ourselves as well. You can see the correlation with this PFQ and other measures to be significant, but it's not 0.60 or 0.80 as you would like. But it's good enough to measure if people are at risk. And that's all you need to know in order to get to, uh, to, to, to for further studies. Um, there are different ideas of how exercise can influence um, health or mental resilience and the different pathways. I will not go into detail on this. I want to actually show some interesting results on um, this physical fitness. So if you ask people to fill it in and you also have healthy individuals, And you also have a, a, a whole range of quantum measures, let's say clock drawing, MMSC, um, verbal fluency, um, all kinds of other tests. And you make that into a global quantum function for each individual. Those people with high quantum fitness or uh, um, low physical fitness, they don't differ from each other. Okay, that's fine. So you might say on healthy adults, you don't find an effect of physical fitness. But in the dementia cases, there is a difference. Of course, their global function is lower than the healthy individuals. But importantly, those people with high physical fitness, so these people already have dementia, um, they show a better uh, kind of ability than the, those with low physical fitness. And this doesn't depend on how long they had the dementia. They does, it doesn't depend on whether they had high or low levels of physical fitness before dementia. 
Now that's relevant because it tells you that you could, if a person has dementia, you could help them uh, slow down the the mental deterioration by having them more uh, physically activities, and that supports what a lot of people do in the community. Okay, from research to practice, very briefly, and then I wrap up. Um, it takes a long time before foundational research leads into practice, uh, uh, actual practice. And I would suggest we should speed up this process. It's good to do all this foundational research, but maybe there's a way of speeding up uh, uh, and helping people now or next year. One way of doing that would be to include your target audience in your research, right? If you include your elderly parents in your research, then and you find an effect, then say, okay, just keep doing what you're doing. Eat more healthily. Uh, I don't have to wait 17 years for you then to start doing it. Yeah. Um, engage your local authorities in research. It's very helpful because in the end, they are providing the community policies. Engage government if they want to listen. Um, provide clear sound bites. The emotional materials shows purge the, the negative stuff in your information booklets that you have for older adults. Physical fitness supports mental resilience. Positive sound bite. Exercise is beneficial even after diagnosis. Positive sound bite. The thing is, these are all evidence based. We need to get into that practice faster. We need to do this. We need to get to the level where we boost people into the, the higher trajectory. And that's the interest. I put here tech activities. I didn't know that Milo would be here, but the tech activities here is how do people use technology? Are they offloading their working memory load on the technology? If so, then their brain becomes lazy. So there's not much research on that, but those, maybe some in the audience here, uh, might be interested in, in researching this. How we how can we use technology collaboratively? And that's it. These are people I want to thank, and I want to thank you for listening.